Pastor Stephen Brooks, and welcome today to our midweek Bible study called Morning Glory. I want to invite you to grab your Bibles and meet me today in the Old Testament book of Judges. And let's find out what we are supposed to do when we come up against iron chariots. Praise God. This is going to be exciting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We ask that your Holy Spirit would come and illuminate the scriptures. That the very eyes of our understanding be flooded with light. That we can take your word and apply it to our lives today in a very tangible and a very real way. We thank you, Father. Thank you for your grace and your strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Today we're in Judges chapter 1, verse 1. When you think of uh, judges, of course, uh, sometimes with our Western mindset, we think of a judge that sits in a courtroom and decides uh, issues based upon legality, the law of the land. And the judges of the Old Testament uh, did do a little bit of that, but primarily they were military leaders that God raised up uh, in times when the nation had fallen away from the Lord, and these judges would bring them back to the Lord uh, and also, of course, deliver them from their adversaries. It's a, real, it's a real joy to read this because there are so many parallels to our modern day walk with the Lord. Most scholars believe that the book of Judges and also the book of Joshua just before it were written by the prophet Samuel. So as we jump into this today, uh, you're going to see some similarities, I really believe, that will help you with your life today to live in victory. Now verse 1. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be the first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Well, you know, the thing was is that when you read through the book of Joshua, you see victory after victory after victory. And you, just by reading the book, you would think, wow, they, they took the whole land. Everything that God promised Abraham, all that giant landmass, they inherited all of it, and they just kicked the enemy out, and there's nothing left to do. But really, there's a lot of gaps. There were a lot of areas where even land that they took, later on the enemy would come and take it back. And even though Joshua did a great job, and he was a brilliant leader, highly anointed of the Lord, there were still, uh, honestly, just a lot of pockets, a lot of areas of land that belonged to God's people, and they never took it. So there's a lot left sitting on the table that they need to grab and take by faith. And so now that Joshua has moved off the scene, uh, Israel says, okay, let's go. It's time for us to get, get active and take what rightfully belongs to us. Who's going first out of the 12 tribes? And it's important because whichever tribe goes up first uh, in war, you know what? If they win, well, that's going to be an incentive and a spark for the others to come forward in faith and do what they're called to do as well. But if you flop and get defeated, that's going to spread fear throughout the rest of the 12 tribes. So they wisely ask for God's guidance, God's insight, and the Lord answers them in verse 2. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. So this is a fulfillment, I believe, of the prophecy that you see Jacob giving over his 12 sons, particularly the prophecy over Judah, as mentioned in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, when it says that Judah will be the scepter that never departs. In other words, there's leadership, the scepter representing authority and leadership, and now you see that very active in the tribe of Judah. Okay, so they're ready to go up and they're ready to take the land because they still have a lot to inherit. Verse 3, So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me to my allotted territory, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. This is fascinating because Judah had such a large area of territory they really even struggled to fill it up and to occupy it and have enough people to uh, take up the residence thereof. Uh, so Simeon, they actually had their tribal allotment within the boundaries of Judah. It's very, very interesting, but it worked out really well. And Judah basically acting like a big brother, saying, uh, look, Simeon, come with me as we go up against the Canaanites and let's 
let's get what rightfully belongs to me. And then when we're done, I'll turn right around with you. And since we are the largest tribe, we'll come back you up and we'll help you get what you're supposed to get also. So uh, it worked out really well. And Judah was a very large tribe. Uh, today, if you were to go to Israel and just ask, uh, you know, your average Israeli off the, off the street, hey, could you possibly tell me what tribal lineage you have? Well, most wouldn't know, uh, although there are some that do because the Jews are very good record keepers. But when it comes to tribal lineage, most people, if they were to respond to you, and I've had a few tell me this, they say, well, I probably belong to the tribe of Judah. Why? Because you're playing it numerically safe. Judah was the largest tribe, so uh, numerically, uh, by lot, you probably did uh, descend from them. But, you know, there's still the other 11 tribes. But it's a good combination. Judah and Simeon, they're, they're, they're brothers, they're neighbors, they're right next door to each other, and they're going to really take it to the Canaanites. Who are the Canaanites? Well, think of it like this. Noah had three sons. He had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham, um, Ham caused a lot of trouble. Uh, Ham gave birth to Canaan, and out of Canaan you have the Canaanites. Not only do you have the Canaanites, but these tribes all descended from Ham. You have the Canaanites, and you had the Jebusites. Uh, the Jebusites were the ones that held the fortress of Jerusalem. You have the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites. You have the Arvidites, the Zimmerites, the Hamathites, and of course, the good old Canaanites. And what a problem they caused for Israel. But you know what? God was able to help them to overcome, step by step, each of these pagan, heathen nations that were very, very corrupt and very evil. And you know, they all descended from Ham. And Ham was cursed uh, with really a double whammy of a curse because his father Noah, uh, I guess Noah, you know, after the flood, he decided that he, he just wanted to have a career change. So knowing that the shipbuilding industry was probably not going to be very popular for a while, he moved out of that and it says that he started a, a, a vineyard and he became a farmer. Well, when it was time to harvest the grapes, I guess he got a little bit happy with the grapes. They, they ferment it, and he drank it, and he got drunk. And Ham walked in and saw his father completely naked. I guess he probably laughed, thought it was funny. And he went and told his two brothers, and his two brothers didn't think it was funny at all. And they, when they came in to cover up their father, they even walked in backwards with a blanket to cover him up. And when Noah came to his senses, he knew what Ham had done. Ham was his youngest son, and he, and he cursed him. And he said, he said, not only will you be a servant, he said, you will be a servant of servants forever. Wow. And uh, I tell you what, that was, uh, <laughs> that was a, tough, uh, a tough hit for ham. Maybe that's why we shouldn't eat ham, huh? Well, no, there's no relation to that in pork. But uh, anyhow, uh, that's why we have the Canaanites. Now, it's the land of Canaan, but if you want to possess the promised land, you're going to have to get rid of the Canaanites. Praise the Lord. Let's find out what happened. Verse 4, Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their, hand, into their hand. So the Canaanites, they were pretty tough. They lived in fortified cities. The Perizzites, a little easier. They lived in open villages on the plain. So they were delivered into the hand of Judah and Simeon, and they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adon, uh, excuse me, Adonai Bezek in Bezek and fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Uh, some of these words you can probably recognize when you hear the name Adonai Bezek. Adonai means Lord, so uh, this guy was the king or the, or the Lord over Bezek. And so Judah and Simeon fought against him. They defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and caught him. And look what they did to him. They cut off his thumbs and big toes. I wonder what type of prophetic inspiration inspired the, tribe, the tribal leaders of Judah and Simeon to take this pagan king and to cut off his thumbs and to chop suey, his big toes. Well, back in those days, of course, if you cut off the big toes, uh, a person has lost their balance and their ability to run away. And if you cut off their thumbs, now they can no longer ha uh, handle weaponry. And so they are rendered, you know, pretty much harmless and ineffective. But it was a prophetic act 
they didn't really know what this king, this evil king had done in the background until he confessed. Verse 7, And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table, as I have done, so God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Well, I really believe, as the Scripture says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, that God is not mocked, that whatsoever a man sows, look, whether it's cutting off a person's thumbs or toes, whatever a man sows, so shall he reap. And Adonai Bezek cut off the toes and the thumbs of 70 other kings, and suddenly, when it's his time for judgment, the leaders of Judah and Simeon just had a, they, without even knowing the man's background, they just, they just knew we're supposed to render this judgment to him. And they cut off his toes and thumbs. You know what? We need to treat others the way that we ourselves would want to be treated. We need to walk in love. We need to walk in righteousness. We need to walk in truth. We need to love people and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ everywhere we go. We need to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord because the way that you treat others and the way that you live and the way that you honor the Lord, all of that will come back in a harvest into your life, whether it's positive because you've been doing good or negative because you've sown the wrong kind of seeds. But I believe that you're going to sow the right seeds of righteousness and, and of, of the fruit of the Spirit. And every harvest coming back to you is a harvest of blessing. Praise the Lord. Verse 8, Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Well, this is interesting because you would think, great, they've got Jerusalem. Well, not so fast. It's easy to read as you work through these stories that although they took Jerusalem, they could only hold it temporarily. You'll see later that Benjamin tries to go take Jerusalem. Well, hold on, I, I thought Judah just took it. Well, they took it temporarily. And obviously, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Jebusites, said, you know what, we, we miss our home, we want it back. And so they reoccupied Jerusalem, and then Benjamin made a try, they made, some, uh, they made some progress, maybe got a small section of that area, but then also the Jebusites eventually drove them out. And it wasn't until 400 years later, long after these stories here, that David came on the scene and one day saw Jerusalem and said, you know what, that would that city sitting up on a hill like that of course there wasn't much of a city it was a small uh, it was a small place that the Jebusites had but David had enough for, wisdom and foresight to say you know what that would make a tremendous uh, place where the capital of Israel could be and he had the 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 wisdom of God to see that and he said I'm taking that I'm taking that, and he took it, and ever since then, uh, Jerusalem has belonged to uh, the Israelis. Praise God. And as far as the land of Israel, the Jews are the only people that have ever inhabited what we know as the land of Israel with an unbroken chain for thousands and thousands of years. Other tribes have come and gone. Other nations have come and gone, but the Jews have always been there uninterrupted from the days of the Israelites as we are seeing right here even in the book of Judges. Praise the Lord. So they took Jerusalem only temporarily. Verse 9, And afterward the children of Judah went down the fight against the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountains in the south and in the lowland. Well, the problem was, and you'll see this often through the book of Judges, they would make progress, they would take some land, and then they would lose it. And it was a very frustrating experience for them. But you know what? You have to walk right with the Lord. And that's, that's what we see in these stories is that the Israelites, they would go into idolatry. And because of their idolatry, God will allow a heathen nation to oppress them, subjugate them, torment them, frustrate them. And then after a period of time, maybe 10 or 20 years, Israel will say, we can't take it anymore. God deliver us. And so God would send a judge, a military leader who would rise up 
and would be strong enough to overthrow the occupying power. And then once the enemy was pushed out or pushed back, and there would be peace. Sometimes the peace would last for 40 years, other times 80 years, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. But in the interim, there would be peace. Israel would worship the Lord, but then they would fall back into idolatry again, get reoccupied again by a pagan power, and the whole thing would just repeat itself over and over and over. God raised up another judge, repeat it again. God raised up another judge. God repeated it again because uh, of Israel's finicky behavior and unwillingness to go in and possess what God said, I've already given it to you. Just go take it. Wow, praise the Lord. So you really need to have a committed heart where you say, I sell out completely to the Lord. I'm living for the Lord. I'm living for His glory. And I'm going to do all that He's called me to do. And I'm going to possess everything that He says is in my tribal allotment and my inheritance. And I'll tell you, God's got some good things for you. I want to touch on that again here in just a little bit. But let's continue on as we see Judah and Simeon endeavoring to inherit what rightfully belongs to them. Verse 17, And Judah went with his brother Simeon, and they attacked the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath, and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormah. So Judah and Simeon, they did pretty good. They're, they were making some progress here and there. But overall, sadly, they, they fell short. And now you begin to see the fullness of that uh, coming up short begin to come out in the following scriptures. Verse 18, uh, also Judah took Gaza with its territory, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out to mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland. That's the good area, of course. That's where the best farming, the, the best agriculture would be. Why could they not drive them out? Because they had chariots of iron. And again, this is one of those areas where the Lord tells us that Judah took the, the area of Gaza. Now you hear about Gaza, that's the same area uh, today in the news. And you see that they also took Ashkelon. Of course, Ashkelon is still there today. These are, these are areas in what would be considered today the Palestinian territory. They're just uh, south of Tel Aviv a little bit. They're right there on the uh, southern uh, end of the uh, Mediterranean coast uh, of Israel. Very, very pretty area. But this is also the area where the Philistines occupied. And you can move a few years into the future, and you see Samson raised up as a judge. And what's Samson having to do? He's having to drive out the Philistines. And where were they at? They were in Gaza. They were in Ashkelon. Well, Pastor Stephen, it says here that Judah took that area. Yes, they did, and then they lost it. They could not hold it. They did not keep it. And you need to be very uh, persistent that when you walk in healing, that you're keeping your healing. You walk in prosperity, you're keeping your prosperity. You walk in peace, you keep your peace. You walk in the joy of the Lord, you're staying in the joy of the Lord, and you're not going to let the devil come and steal any, not a single one, of your blessings. Look, don't give up any ground to the enemy. It belongs to you. It doesn't belong to the old devil. Praise God. The blessings of God belong to you. Hallelujah. And you know, by the way, th those territories today that are uh, occupied as Palestinian territories, when the Lord comes back uh, in the millennium and rules from Jerusalem, all that land is going back over to Israel. Why? Because God promised Abraham, this land is for you and your descendants. It belongs to Israel. It doesn't belong to anybody else. And even on the east side of the Jordan River, where the tribe of Ru uh, Reuben and uh, Gad and Manasseh are located, which is modern-day Jordan. That's all coming back to Israel also. God, in His Word, said that land belongs to Israel. So it doesn't matter who's living there. They're going to have to give it up. They're going to have to move, and uh, Jesus will sort all of that out. But my friends, you always want to be a supporter of Israel because God blessed the nation of Israel. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. And so, you know, I, I know the Palestinians, they'll, they'll tell you that, no, this is, this is our nation. We, we've been here. Some of the Palestinians will even tell you that this is crazy. They'll even say that we are the modern-day descendants of the Philistines. But you know what? Not one single anthropologist would agree with a crazy idea. That's a total myth. 
uh, the, there is no such thing as a Palestinian nation. The Philistines were completely destroyed by the Babylonian army. There were none left. They were completely killed and that race was wiped out. There are no modern day uh, Philistines. And so Palestinians think, well, we're the, we're the descendants of these ancient tribes. No, they're not. And everybody that studies it knows that they're not either. Uh, the Palestinians are, are actually uh, Arab refugees that just came and moved into the area about 70 or 80 years ago. Well, what's an Arab? If you look up the word Arab, Arab actually means in the orig its original uh, language, Arabic language, it means mixed race. So the people living there are not like descendants of the uh, Philistines or anything like that. No, those, those races are long gone, long wiped out, long destroyed. Those are just Arab people that are living there. Most of them have Egyptian blood, some of them Persian blood, some of the, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia and, and things like that. But no, the, they're, they're the only people that have been living in Israel with an unbroken chain for thousands and thousands of years are the Jewish people. The land clearly belongs to them. Even the so-called Palestinian territory is actually all the territory of Israel. Praise God. And so we see that Judah and Simeon had a real problem of trying to gain the lowland, which is the best part. Why? Because uh, the enemy there had iron chariots. The Canaanites were not willing to give it up. They had iron chariots. So why could not... Judah and Simeon take it. Really, if you, if you stop and think about it, they could not take that land because they were not strong enough. And they came up against an uh, enemy power that had a very well-developed military. And you know, Judah just stood back and said, you know what, we've got some good guys on our side, and we've got some good weapons ourselves, but we can't handle this thing of iron chariots. And they could not take their promised land. I think when you run up against iron chariots or you run up against a barrier that the enemy says, you know what, you've done pretty good. Maybe you took this little area over here. You took that little area over there. That's nice, but you're not really going to get the good stuff. When you run up against an iron chariot, you really need to meet the Holy Spirit as the spirit of might. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the spirit of might because the Holy Spirit has the power to put you over. There is the wisdom of God. There is a plan of God. There is a strategy of heaven that even though the enemy may say, you'll never do it, God says, trust me, walk close with me, and you're, you will come into that land, and you will possess it. But my friends, just like the ancient Israelites, it is very, very important that you walk close with the Lord. And some, sometimes they're trying to take the land. They're trying, to, they're trying to take the promises. And at the same time, they have idols that they worship. They had mixture. They're trying to worship Jehovah God, but at the same time, they've got these other little, you know, bells and Ashtaroths and all these little statues they would carry around. And you can't be doing that when you're serious about serving God and you're trying to possess the fullness of your inheritance. You must sell out to the Lord and go all the way. And if you do that, if you're like a Moses and you're like a Joshua, fully committed, you will go in and the enemy's power will melt. The chariots aren't the problem. It's the walk with the Lord. It's the lack of strength. It's the lack of power. God will supply you with the strength that you need. Praise the Lord. He will give you all the strength and energy that you need, but you must continue to push and walk very closely with the Lord and trust Him. Glory to God you're going through. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go to verse 21. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. Well, we have seen now the tribe of Simeon, the tribe of Judah. They made some progress, but overall they fell short of possessing their inheritance. Now we come to the tribe of Benjamin, and we see that they're doing pretty good. They're uh, up front. They're driving out the Jebusites. Uh, they're occupying Jerusalem, but it did not last because when David came to take Jerusalem, it was overrun with the Jebusites. They had firm control over it, so Benjamin could not hold it. By the way, I like the, uh, the tribe of Benjamin. It's a good tribe. Uh, many of the men of Benjamin were left-handed, and when you, uh, I'm left-handed, so perhaps if I would have lived back in that day, I would have belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. Of course, I'm not sure, but uh, we do see that King Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin, as well as the Apostle Paul. 
he also was a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin. And so they drove out the Jebusites, and, uh, but they couldn't push them completely out. And it says, the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. So you've got a real problem when you've got neighbors next to you that are evil, that are doing horrible abominations, and God said drive them completely out or they will corrupt you. Well, you couldn't drive them out. Now they're close by and they're going to begin to influence you in a very negative way. We understand today from a new covenant perspective that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, the evil spirits, the, the wicked spirits in high places. So my friends, through prayer and obedience to the Word of God and walking in faith and in trust, God will take you through and you will be able to drive them fully out and not have to tolerate uh, the devil's occupation in any area of your life. Now verse 22, And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. Well, this is wonderful because you see the house of Joseph taking Bethel, and it looks like they're getting a good start, and they did have a good start, but they were not able to maintain that momentum, and they also fell short of uh, occupying the land that God had promised to them. The house of Joseph was the house of the double blessing, the double portion. So you would have the two tribes making up the house of Joseph. That would be Ephraim and Manasseh. And Manasseh grew to be a very large tribe. Praise the Lord. So they took Bethel, but they were not able to go that far because we see so in verse 27. It says, however, however Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or did the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its villages. Uh, I mean, it goes on and on. They, they were supposed to take Megiddo. They couldn't do it. Uh, it says, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. So Manasseh only got a small portion of what really belonged to them. And you know what the Canaanites said? We've been here for quite some time, and we like this land. And uh, you know what? Uh, we're just not going to leave without a fight. And they didn't, and Manasseh cannot push them out. So my friends, as Christians, as believers, we need to really pursue the Lord and go after our inheritance and rightfully take what belongs to us. You have to take it by faith, praise the Lord, or else the enemy will resist and he will hold back those blessings. And you know what? You could just stand around and look at it. You can see it, but he'll say you can't touch it. But with faith, you can go up and take it. Praise the Lord. Uh, verse 29, Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahal. So the Canaanites dwelt among them. So over and over, we're seeing that many of these tribes made a little progress, but in the larger scale of the picture, they failed greatly. They came up far short of what they were supposed to possess. And concerning the tribe of Zebulun, it says the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under tribute. Well, that might sound like a pretty good compromise because if we put the Canaanites under tribute, we can't really drive them out. We can't, you know, they're too strong for us, so we can overcome them to the degree where we can put the pressure on them and, you know, get them under an agreement where they're paying us tax. Well, economically, that may sound like a good idea, but my friends, I want you to know it was an absolute disaster. The Lord told them, He told the people of Israel, drive these nations out. They are an abomination in my sight. They do horrible things. They will corrupt you. They will corrupt your children. And if you start giving your children to them as husbands and uh, wives, and you start taking their, their daughters over here for marriage for your sons, there, there will be all types of intermingling with their religions and their, uh, their paganism. And that's exactly what happened. And what seemed to be like a good idea by putting them under tribute was actually one of the worst things they could have done. Now verse 31, nor did Asher, okay, so now we come to the tribe of Asher, nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Echo. So it begins to list some of the areas that Asher was uh, 
uh, had allocated to them. These would be the coastal areas of northern Israel, right on the beautiful Mediterranean. Uh, in the ancient days, this would have been known as the area of Phoenicia, really from uh, Tyre all the way up to Mount Carmel. If you've ever been to Mount Carmel in Israel, you know how beautiful that area it is. But they were also giving uh, the city uh, as, of Echo as their inheritance. And I'll be honest with you, Echo, uh, from my perspective, is probably one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I mean, th th this is a place that uh, when you look at it today, you can Google it. It's spelled A-C-C-O. Uh, an another uh, spelling for it is A-C-R-E, like Acre. But just pull it up on the internet and look at the pictures. You're just like, wow, this place is amazing. It looks like a like a castle fortress? Well, that's because the uh, Crusaders took over it in the uh, 1300s, in the 1400s, uh, and then they began to uh, build their fortresses and, and things like that. And today, most of the activity, most of the construction done by the Crusaders is far beneath the ground, even 20 or 30 feet below the surface level of the street. But you can go down through the tunnels all through Echo and see the amazing fortifications that the Crusaders built. But this was a beautiful city, and uh, eventually the uh, Crusaders couldn't hold it. They, they had already abandoned Jerusalem when the Turks took over, but uh, they retreated to Echo. Echo was their stronghold, and it was the major port on the Mediterranean coast, and uh, the Turks eventually took that as well. Well, in 1799, Napoleon showed up, and when he saw Echo, not just that it was a fortified port city, but when he saw how beautiful it was, he said, if I could just capture Echo, I would have the whole world at my feet. But he couldn't do it. And uh, he really wanted it. And, you know, if you take a look at Echo, you'll be like, wow, that is a great place. It's, it's a beautiful place. So, you know what? Asher had Echo as one of the cities that God said, it's yours. Go take it. Go get it and they couldn't do it. They would not drive out the enemy. And I, just, I believe, and I wanna share this with you today, that just like Asher, I believe that there are things in your allotment that God, uh, uh, as it says in the scriptures, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. I believe that God has things distinctly allocated to you in your destiny, in your inheritance that are so beautiful, it, they're, they're like diamonds. They're like the city of Echo, that you have things where you have no need to be jealous of what somebody else might has uh, or what somebody else might be walking in. Why? Because your inheritance is beautiful. Your inheritance that God has given to you is amazing. But my friends, you're going to have to possess it. You're going to have to take it. And I'm telling you, God has good things for you. Rise up and be the person that God has called you to be. So many of these tribes came up so short, but that is not going to be your testimony. I see you going into the fullness of your land. I see you possessing all that Jesus says, this is rightfully yours, go take it. And you are blessed to be a blessing. So rise up and go do what God has called you to do. There may be some iron chariots, but with the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit, those things will melt before you, and you will take that, that area of your destiny that is next on the map for your occupying. Praise the Lord. Verse 33, uh, it says that Naphtali, it says, excuse me, it says, nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. So Naphtali also came up far short. Verse 34, the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. Even the tribe of Dan could not capture the area that was promised to them. And the Amorites pushed them to go live in an area that they don't even want to live in. And so it says in verse 35, the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Harris in Ajalon. And you know what? They just said, we're, we're not going to leave. We, we know that you guys want to come take what you believe belongs to you, but we're not going to give it up without a fight. So my friends, you need to use your faith and let the strength of God lift you, lift you and take you higher and higher and higher. And you can, you can do all that God has called you to do. You have to walk very close with the Lord. That's, that's the thing that God told Joshua. That's why Joshua was so successful. You've got to meditate in the Word day and night, and then you will have good success. Uh, and so that's what they were struggling with in the book of Judges, trying to possess their inheritance, but doing so half-heartedly, and then coming up far short of what God 
had allocated to them. But my friends, you're going all the way with the Lord. You're going all the way with the Lord. That's why these stories are in the Bible. They are for our admonition, our encouragement, and they are, they are speaking over the balcony of heaven. And these individuals are saying, go do it. You can do it. Christ is for you, and the power of the Spirit is in you and with you. Praise the Lord. So today, let's take communion and let's celebrate the Lord and His great victory because His victory is our victory. And He has broken through for us. And His breakthrough anointing is upon our lives. And as we walk with Him, we go from glory to glory and from one level of faith to a higher level of faith. And we go from strength to strength. And you need that strength. You need that strength to break through, especially when you're dealing with iron chariots. Praise God. Let's grab some unleavened bread and some grape juice. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you. We, we sanctify this and consecrate it. This is now the flesh and the blood of Jesus. We give you praise, O God. Father, as we receive the body of Jesus, we thank you that iron chariots are no problem for the Lord, that He can break through those and shatter those things, and that we can ride on His coattails into victory upon the wings of our great King. So, Father, we give you praise that you are opening doors that no man could open because our hope, our faith, and our trust are in you. Thank you, Father, for the body of Jesus. We receive Him now. Praise the Lord. I see you going through. I see you taking your promised land, every single bit of it, every enemy melting and falling before you. You're too strong in the Lord. You're too strong in the Lord, and you're getting stronger too. <laughs> Praise God. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that we can have a clean conscience before you, that we don't have a guilt conscious, consciousness, we have a righteousness consciousness because of who we are in Christ. Father, may our full identification be attached to Jesus and the finished work that He accomplished at Calvary. We thank You, Father, that He is our great King, He is our leader, our general, and we follow Him in every beat of His heart. We give you praise. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, let us now receive the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, I pray that your people may know the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of might. Now we give you praise for strength and for sudden breakthroughs in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that we determine to follow carefully your word, to meditate in it, and to do all that it says to do. We give you praise. We thank you for your wisdom and your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. My friends, thanks for watching. You have a wonderful day, and I'll see you back next time. Bye-bye.